Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Alrighty, folks, today we are talking about winter watering with James Clark. James is up in Canada, and he comes to us from the Gallagher team, but he actually has livestock of his own as well. And so we are going to talk about what water systems he uses and different strategies to help make sure that you don't have to chop ice this year because I know I don't like that. This episode is actually a rerun from last fall, but it's really valuable and I want to make sure that you guys are reminded of how you can be proactive about having effective watering systems for your cattle this coming winter. Now, I do want to remind you that I do have a free newsletter that comes out every week that's so that you get this podcast, the article, and industry news sent straight to your inbox. So just head over to my website to sign up for that. With that, let's hear from James. Well, James, I'm excited to have you back on the show again. And today, you know, we might not be giving everyone the warm and fuzzy is talking about cold weather, but hopefully we can make them feel a little better by giving them some helpful information about uh, winter watering systems. So how are you doing today? Cold, (laughs) (laughs) but I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm doing well. I appreciate you uh, joining me from the field so that we can actually see what type of watering system you have set up. And for those watching the video portion, they can get that visual representation. So I sure appreciate that. My pleasure. So remind the audience again, briefly, kind of where you're located and a little bit about the operation you run today. Yeah. So usually you're, I'm sure your guests are used to me being the Gallagher expert, but today I'm a rancher just like everybody else. Um, So I'm in Eastern Ontario, a small town called Winchester. Uh, Currently today, it feels like 14 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 10 Celsius. And um, we do a small, small, a uh, herd of uh, cows and some sheep. Um, they're on the other side of the barn right now. Um, you know, we usually run about four to 10 cows, um, steers, heifers, whatever we can get to cheap uh, a year. And then we have our flock of uh, 30 sheep. Well, awesome. So can you kind of talk about, you know, what's that biggest challenge you personally face with winter watering? And I'm sure many others face this as well. <laughs> Well, yes, um, across Canada, across northern U.S., um, water freezing, water lines freezing, um, you know, depending on where you live, you either have to go, you know, you can go anywhere from just two feet down to eight feet in the ground to, to get your water source before it's uh, you're under the frost line. So honestly, that's the biggest challenge that uh, I face and I faced when I first uh, bought this property and then uh, that a lot of uh, people that I talk to face is getting that water source to somewhere where the animals are. All right. So beside you, what type of watering unit do you have there? And how does that work for you in the winters? Yeah, so I run uh, Miracle water tanks. Um, Usually I have these ones on all year. Um, I have one on this side, one on the other side, and those are for my paddocks as the animals come back. Um, It's just an easy automatic water that I can always leave on. and so in the summer, I run those uh, Rubbermaid bins. But uh, the, the one that I have next to me is a 28, uh, 2700. Um, you can see the dome top. Uh, I got those ones specifically so that the sheep uh, don't jump on top of it. Um, it's a couple inches of insulation all the way around. It uh, has a water heater in it. It has a water line, um, a water, I mean, um, a heat trace. Uh, that goes all the way down so it keeps all of the water coming into it above freezing which is fantastic that is really nice so then i know we've talked a little bit about those before on the show for just in general watering systems so are there larger ones or ones um with more um drinking holes for cattle or what does that look like Yeah. So, you know, when we were looking at it, my wife and I were trying to figure out how to set this up. Um, There's double sided, single sided square. Uh, There's also ones that have balls uh, in them, the ball or floats. Um, We we figure that right next to the barn with a good wind brace, uh, this would be plenty, nice open water. um, And the heat would be enough to keep it. And it has worked for us. Um, When I was thinking about putting water out in the field, there are, you know, one, two, four, and six uh, ball 
So depending on how many cows or sheep or, or horses or whatever you have out in the field, um, and those balls are there to protect from the wind shear where you don't have any wind protection. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we were looking at it, these ones fit perfectly for the cows that we use and the sheep. So it worked as a well-rounded option for us. So before you had those, what type of watering systems did you use before? Um, like many people, we were stubborn and we said, oh, we'll just, we'll just run hot water, hot buckets of water out to the field. That'll be fine. Uh, but as we got bigger and bigger, obviously that didn't work out for us. So, um, we started trying to experiment with, you know, heat traces on hoses, heated hoses. Um, and honestly, it was just, you know what, let's just do it right. And we dug the water line straight to here and straight to the other side so that it's coming under the frost line. It's heated all the way up and then it's heated when it's in here. Now, were you uh, smart enough to do that when the weather was still warm enough? Or was it one of those things where you had to be reminded by the time it started getting colder? Because I know how sometimes that works for all of us. <laughs> No, luckily living in Eastern Canada, you remember sometimes all the way up until the end of May. Uh, so luckily in April, when the, when the ground was soft enough, uh, I went, I'm done. I'm not bringing another bucket this weekend. We're digging the water lines. <laughs> so what type of planning did you do going into like planning where those water lines would go? What did that process look like? Because it's important to kind of have a future plan in mind. So that way, if you need to adapt at some point, you can. So what did that process look like for you? Yeah, so uh, we sat down, we tried to figure out, is one gonna be enough? Do we need two heated? Where do we need to bring, it's not just the water, it's also the electricity. Um, where do we need to run grounded or GFCI plugs? Um, so we we landed on two spots best for best bang for our buck um and so that we could have uh winter paddocks um so if i can take a step back it went way beyond just the watering it, it actually went to how are we going to winter our animals how are we going to deal with growth uh do we want to stick with these animals do we want to keep building do we want to keep growing uh and so we went for okay if the biggest we could ever imagine ourselves being on this property what would we need? And it was two waters, one on this side, one on that side. So we have two wells luckily on this property. So we just ran the line here and then one on the opposite side, straight in the ground, get it done and over with. And uh, the first year we only used this one. And uh, two years ago, we started using the one on the other side. Well, awesome. I appreciate you explaining that. So for people who do not have these specific types of water tanks, what other options have you seen them use to keep their floats from freezing up, um, even the drinking holes from freezing up? Because there are a lot of different types of water tanks out there. Yeah, um, you know, us farmers, we think we're inventive and engineers and stuff sometimes. So I've seen everything from um, rapping about you know, a fire hazard's worth of, of trace wire all the way around a, a valve, around a bucket, um, around the, the hose coming up to it, um, using two or three 500 watt um, puck heaters into old, um, those Rubbermaid tanks. Um, you know, there's so many different things that we can do that will be like, this will work. Uh, for me, I just, I keep telling myself, do it right the first time. And my dad was the same way. My grandfather was the same way. Just do it right the first time and you won't have to worry about it after. Well, absolutely. And uh, it doesn't uh, take much ice chopping to wish you would have just done it the first time or done it earlier. I can vouch for that one. <laughs> well, the fun thing that I like to talk to with my American friends, Canadian friends is, you know, when it's minus 40 and for your listeners, that's both. Um, Fahrenheit and Celsius. So when it's minus 40 out and you realize that something's frozen, you can't get, even get into a latch or you can't get into there and chopping isn't working, running back and forth with the kettle or with hot water from your tank, it is just not fun. No, I, I can imagine not. And, uh, I'm kind of a wimp. I, with, I, if my hands get cold. I'm done for. So <laughs> I like to keep my mittens on as long as possible. So is there any prep work that you recommend um, before winter, obviously, to make sure tanks are ready to go? What does that look like? 
Yeah, so um, the way that I do it is in October, for me here in Eastern Canada, um, October, you might get some frosts, but it'll never be bad enough that you'll be chopping ice. So usually beginning of October, I take all of the heater pucks that are in each of the water tanks and I put them in my freezer. And then I plug them in and make sure that the thermostats are working, that they're heating up, that everything's working on them. Uh, I do the same thing with the trace wire. Um, and then I run each one of them full open, no valve, no float, just to make sure that everything is working in here and there's no leaks. Um, so those are the two big things that I make sure on these two tanks that I have. So my advice to anybody who has tanks that are going to be out in the winter that are heated, test everything. Because it's better to test it when, like you said, you can feel your fingers and you can take your mitts off uh, than when it's, you know, 10 degrees Fahrenheit minus, you know, if it's in the negatives, you're just not having a good day. Absolutely. So before we wrap up today, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, you alluded to it. Plan. Plan ahead. Plan for the future. Don't plan for tomorrow. Don't plan for today. Plan for 10 years from now. If you think that in 10 years you're going to need a second one, run the water line now. It'll be cheaper now. It'll make more sense in the future and you'll have everything ready for you. And then the other planning is plan before every winter. Test everything. Make sure it's working because if you don't, December, January rolls around, you're going to be wishing you had. All right, James. Well, thank you for hopping on for a quick and informative uh, podcast episode today. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the visual and you showing uh, what that tank looks like for people to actually see what it looks like um, when applied to a real operation. So I appreciate that. I appreciate being on and always, uh, always happy to participate in your podcast. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.